for quite some time I've been very keen to do this video uh, and it's been a fair bit of research so here we go today we're taking a look at a very interesting character called Peter the Hermit Peter the Hermit was the person who led the so-called People's Crusade um, a very interesting person and I, I, I think someone who brought about something that was very perhaps in some ways blazar in other ways uh, quite amazing it's, a, it's an astonishing feat for some individual person but let's take a look at peter the hermit So, Peter the Hermit, who was this guy? In some ways, we don't know a lot about his past. We do know that, we do know in some point of the early 1090s, Peter the Hermit attempted to do a pilgrimage to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is in Jerusalem. It had been desecrated by the Muslims, and he saw it as something that he wanted to do to try and repair it, to try and restore it. Um, but we know that Somewhere into his pilgrimage, his group was attacked by uh, presumably Seljuk Turks and he was forced back. He wasn't able to make it to the Holy Land. There's very strong evidence that Peter the Hermit was present at the Council of Clermont in 1095, um, which was presided over by Pope Urban II. We know that Peter the Hermit very quickly began to preach the, the Pope's message and he traveled from town to town through modern-day France preaching this message. Um, really interesting because obviously Peter the Hermit was able to embody his own experiences of pilgrimage into this, this preaching. He was able to, to utilize his own kind of um, his own travels and trials and what he saw um, along with the Pope's message which was about Christians being persecuted, Christian places of worship being destroyed and Christian sort of sites of pilgrimage being desecrated. Sought permission from Simeon II. Now he's an interesting person too. He was, um, Simeon II was the head of the Catholic Church, the, the Orthodox Church in Jerusalem. Peter the Hermit, very quickly, once he gained this permission to do a crusade, now I guess Peter's possible sort of understanding was that if he gained permission from senior Christian clerics in the Holy Land, that would be enough for him to do a crusade. It's not, and that's not what the Pope preached. Um, so, is it technically a crusade or not? I don't know, I don't really think so, but, but here we go. Right, Peter starts to muster a group of followers. He starts to bring people together. Now this is interesting because Peter presumably doesn't have, um, we don't know, but it's, there's no indication that Peter the Hermit had a lot of military experience. He doesn't seem to have come from a noble family or anything. He's just someone who seems to be a bit charismatic and able to start building a group. As his group starts to travel around, uh, so does trouble. Trouble follows very, very closely around them. And Peter's group is accused of plundering at places like Lorraine, Cologne and Marie in France. It's believed that Peter at this stage was leading a group of as many as 40,000 men and women. Uh, his intention was to indeed reach the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. On the 22nd of June, 1096, he pillaged Belgrade. Uh, we don't know exactly what led to this, but um, Zeman refers to this and states that as many as 4,000 Hungarians 
were slaughtered during these riots. He then moves on to Serbia, where a large portion of his, we call it a crusader army, um, was attacked and slaughtered. Now, it's very important to state that at this time, crusader armies had no official uniform uh, other than they went under a cross. So many of these crusaders would have worn a smallish cross, roughly a quarter of the size of this one, over their heart. That's actually interesting too, because modern day soldiers wear their medals across the left side of their chest over their heart. Interesting fact. Okay, uh, and when you wear somebody else's medals, they go on the right hand side of your chest. Righto. Um, on the 1st of August, he arrived in Constantinople. Um, on his way into Constantinople, uh, he, there was a, a significant battle and his forces arrived very much underprepared and largely without their heavy equipment. So it's important to understand that, that military equipment at this time would have been worth a fortune. A sword such as this in the medieval period would have been worth the same kind of money as the sports car is today. Chainmail, again, very, very expensive. Good quality helmets would have been worth a fortune. So, um, when Peter's army was attacked in Serbia and lost a lot of this gear, it would have been a, um, pretty much a devastating loss. His intention was to indeed carry out the Pope's purpose and went on to Constantinople. It's interesting because we know that he had several meetings with the commander of Constantinople, uh, the commander of the Byzantines, uh, Alexius, and Alexius seemed very impressed with Peter the Hermit's charis charisma. It was the uh, Byzantine's intention to try and hold the, um, if you like, the, the People's Crusade. Now, at this point, it's very important to, to sort of point out that there had been five or six of these large groups that had travelled through Europe. Unfortunately, in the Balkans, several of them had been basically confronted by large groups of uh, warriors, Serbian warriors and so on. Now, I, I say Serbian, that's not the only place, but um, many of these people were basically taken captive and forced into slavery. Um, and there is a, quite a sad tale. Unless you were traveling in large, well-armed groups, you were simply uh, a ripe target for some of these people. We know um, Peter's group was impatient to get going. It just didn't have the patience, unfortunately. Um, this is a real shame. We know that it, 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 it certainly... Um, Jonathan Riley Smith, the British historian, indicates his opinion that the, um, the, Cru the People's Crusaders were very much about um, impatient. They, they, they would have included knights, they would have included very well-armed and, and well-equipped people, but just perhaps not that many of them, maybe only 50 or 60. If you include, say, some squires in that, maybe another 120 squires, uh, and maybe another... 200 men at arms, that kind of thing. But you need to understand that at this time there was now a group of 50, 60,000 of them. Um, so realistically, not that many of them were very well trained or well equipped. Unfortunately, at this time, the Sultan of the Muslim forces had also heard about the People's Crusade and started to prepare his own forces to meet them. The Sultan obviously would have known the terrain, known the ground and known the, the, the environment. Um, picked out the most obvious places for these people to go the, and laid ambush. The, uh, the People's Crusaders were not um, being very well put up by the, the Byzantines. Now, um, the Byzantine government had promised to look after them until the First Crusader army arrived. Now, this was called the Prince's Crusade, although it really wasn't led by that many princes. The intention was for the Prince's Crusade, the actual first formal crusade, to arrive in Constantinople really within a fairly short period of time. They took a long time to prepare themselves and to equip themselves and to, to get going. 
and I think there's a lot of political differences there and a lot of reasons around language barriers and so on. But they didn't arrive for another year and this wasn't, um, I don't think the People's Crusaders had the patience to wait a whole year. I wish they had. Um, it would have been interesting because the Crusader army would have doubled in size if that was the case. Instead, after a lot of rioting and, and pillaging of some of the local towns, uh, the Byzantines basically sent the People's Crusade across the Borberus. Now, um, within a fairly short period of time, against the clear warnings of the Byzantine government, the People's Crusaders start to push into Turkish territory. The Turks met them uh, on these occasions and there was a, a fairly one-sided battles. Peter the Hermit understood this and he um, went back to petition Alexius for permission to come back with his army and to, to get put up properly and to accommodate it properly and fed and uh, trained properly. That was his intention. Unfortunately, whilst he did this, whilst Peter the Hermit was away, the army moved into Turkish territory straight into an ambush and by all reports was just annihilated to a man. 60,000, roughly speaking, uh, Christian pilgrims were slaughtered. Uh, some taken hostage, some taken as, um, as slaves, but basically they just seem to vanish into thin air. Um, we don't know exactly where the battle took place, but we do know that uh, it would have been somewhere in the, in the region of uh, Sivere. Uh, and that's a real shame. Peter the Hermit, as I say, was in Constantinople at this time. Uh, he is heard of again. Um, he's, he's basically absorbed into the First Crusade with some of his followers. And they marched on to Antioch. And there he is described by, um, I can't pronounce his name, Gibot of Nuge, uh, as a fallen star. He's known as a preacher, a firebrand preacher, who's able to charismatically inspire the, the Crusaders. And even though the Crusaders had essentially run out of food during the Siege of Antioch, uh, remember, in this particular instance, the Crusaders were, uh, I suppose, the aggressors, really, around this Muslim garrison. Um, Peter the Hermit, if this is the same Peter the Hermit, uh, is regarded as being the person who kind of inspired the Christians one more time, I suppose, into the battle, despite their hunger and pain and suffering and injury, and the Christians won one day ahead of the Muslim Relief Army arriving. In 1099, Peter the Hermit is again identified as being the treasurer at the Siege of Aqua, uh, which is around Jerusalem. And later again, in towards the end of 1099, it's thought, anyway, I say thought, that Peter sailed with a, with a crusader force towards modern-day Syria at a place called Latakia. And there he disappears with the crusader force. Peter the Hermit was a very interesting person. Uh, he, he seems to be a very much a firebrand preacher, very inspirational, came really from, from obscurity, I guess, um, and, and was able to lead, to raise an army and lead an army across Europe um, you know, he, he, he may not have been a, a, a strategist, he may not have been a tactician, he may not have had a lot of military experience, but yet he was able to, to raise this group and to, to go on to do what he thought the Pope wanted him to do. Um, I guess he thought that status, social status didn't really matter, and he thought that, you know, look, I can do just as good a job as these other guys and went on to try his best. Um, led these people, unfortunately, um, a lack of preparedness and preparation led this army to its destruction and many, many of these people would have been slaughtered uh, uh, and, and survivors forced into slavery.
but Peter goes on. Peter raises himself again and, and goes on and becomes perhaps the critical figure in the First Crusade and unfortunately disappears in Syria. Uh, I, I think um, Peter's story is an interesting one. I think he's a, a, a fantastic person and I think um, very much an inspirational person. You know, he didn't achieve the notoriety and fame that perhaps other people did, but that's okay. He, he did something that I think is what realistically uh, he felt he had to do. And I, I, I think it's really good. There we go, guys. That's, that's my take on Peter the Hermit. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.